Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is uh, Mike Liskey, Regional Vice President of Sales for the PGM Midwest Region. I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar titled, What You Don't Know Could Cost You. This webinar will provide critical updates in national energy issues and changes impacting PJM. The webinar will feature keynote speaker Matt Smith of Clipper Data Analytics. Following Matt, we will have two GDF Suez speakers, Ken McMahon, Director of Supply for PJM, and Jeffrey Levine, Director of Regulatory Affairs. Ken and Jeffrey will be presenting on capacity performance and other PJM-related issues. We will conclude the presentations with a question and answer session led by Danielle Wilkes, Regional Vice President of Sales for the Mid-Atlantic Region. To submit a web question, click on the green Q&A icon on the lower left-hand side of the screen, type your question into the open area, and then click Submit. Thanks again for being here. Matt, I'll we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mike. All right, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as, as Mike said, my name is Matt Smith. I'm from a company called Clipper Data. And today I'm going to give you a presentation where we are going to take a look into the future. We're going to look at uh, 10 different things uh, that are going to be uh, driving the world of energy next year. And so we're going to kind of run the gamut uh, of the world of energy here. We're going to look at LNG exports. We're going to look at low gasoline prices. Uh, we're going to look at renewables. We're going to look at oil, all kinds of stuff. So uh, without further ado, let's get kicked off here. So number one, first, is a warm winter uh, and the expectation that we will see this. Uh, and the reason I, I believe this is going to happen is, uh, first of all, because of the woolly worm. Uh, now, the woolly worm is this, this, this great creature uh, which you can look at. I, I, I'm uh, not a professional photographer, but I did take this picture. Uh, and what this is showing you is the woolly worm. And uh, the more brown on a woolly worm that there is, uh, it signifies that the, uh, the more mild the winter will be, uh, and the more black on the woolly worm signifies uh, more frigid uh, conditions for the coming winter. So as you can see, evidence number one here uh, shows you that uh, we are set for a warm winter. Um, I'm a big fan of the, the woolly worm. I'm not a big fan of Punxsutawney Tawny Phil. Uh, he's bad news. He can't predict the entire winter. It comes at the end, you know, tries to pre uh, predict the last few weeks. And so Punxsutawney Tawny Phil, bad. Uh, woolly worm, good. Uh, and so uh, I really do believe that we are going to see a, a warm winter for a number of reasons. Uh, just looking in terms of snow, uh, this this uh, image is, is kind of cool because it shows you uh, the, the lighter dots of the, the country, uh, the, the states that are getting um, snow. Some some states get snow all year round. Uh, the uh, some some the kind of darker dots that you see here uh, that's more into the winter when they get the first snow coming through. And so here we are, sort of approaching mid-November, and a lot of the Midwest should really have had uh, snowfall uh, and the Northeast, but we're just not seeing that. Uh, and so uh, this is already giving us a hat tip towards this mild uh, winter that we're heading into. Moving along here, um, so uh, we're, the real driver, not just the woolly worm here, but it, it is El Nino, uh, and that's not to be confused uh, with the Nino, uh, who is uh, this sort of great uh, national institution here in the U.S. But El Nino is this weather phenomenon where you get the warming of the Pacific Ocean uh, by a few degrees. And what happens is uh, you see um, these warmer temperatures then uh, stretch into to Canada and kind of push out the cold front that normally comes down from Canada into the U.S. So looking ahead to next year, uh, this is December to February, sort of, you know, the, the depth of, uh, of the bleak midwinter. Uh, and we really should see above average temperatures across uh, the upper U.S. there. Uh, on on the, the November and December outlooks, uh, you can see these, uh, these warmer conditions kind of spread on the, uh, the eastern seaboard there. But uh, for, for, the, uh, for, the, for the upper U.S., going to 2016, we are going to see warmer conditions. So that's your number one. Um, and so the reason that we're going to be uh, uh, focused on this winter conditions uh, is because of natural gas. And uh, with the warmer winter, it will mean that we'll likely see 10% less natural gas demand coming through uh, because of these conditions. And so that is going to put downward pressure on a market which is already depressed. So if you look at natural gas over a, a, a couple of decades here, you can see that prices they're actually kind of kicking around the levels that they were in the 1990s. Uh, and this is simply because of 
uh, uh, hydraulic fracturing uh, because of horizontal drilling, basically uh, a huge amount of uh, cost cutting that we have seen uh, um, in terms of uh, break-evens, and that is really going to be driving on uh, natural gas prices remaining low going forwards. We're already in this condition now where storage is at uh, an exceedingly strong level. Uh, we're actually tied for the record here at 3929 uh, BCF, which is the record. We have the storage report coming out on Friday, uh, which will propel us to a, to a record. And so uh, you combine these sort of strong levels of storage with the prospect of a mild winter ahead of us, and it's no wonder that we are seeing these natural gas prices around these historically low levels. And what, what we're also seeing is, is because of these low natural gas prices, we're seeing coal pushed out of the generation mix. And that is something that we'll see uh, going into next year uh, and continuing for the years ahead. As you can see from this chart here, uh, top left is the, the, the blue line is coal. And coal uh, accounted for the, the majority of uh, the power generation mix just sort of 15 years ago. Uh, but it's got whittled lower and whittled lower uh, while uh, uh, natural gas has really sort of surged in prominence uh, and to the point where in April of this year, we actually saw natural gas surpass coal uh, as the, in the share of the generation mix. And uh, that's something that uh, we should see going forward. We've seen it again uh, in July. It's typified, typified quite nicely by this chart here. So the two bars on the left-hand side uh, show you coal in, in July 2014 and then 2015. And you've seen coal's share of the generation mix in all these different regions, uh, be it the West, be it the Southeast, Texas, Central, U.S., et cetera, uh, it's dropped uh, across all of them. At the same time, you're seeing natural gas basically replacing that. And we've seen that uh, for 2015. They're rising in all of these different regions as well. So coal down, natural gas up. And um, even though we did see um, coal share of the generation mix sort of really whittled lower, uh, in 2012, that, was any, that wasn't any sort of altruistic reason. Uh, that was simply because natural gas prices got down to this $1.90 level. Uh, and uh, the reason this is key is because it's a different scenario to where we are now uh, in that back then uh, it was driven by economics, whereas now there's more um, sort of vilification of coal going on. Um, but the key, the key element of all of this is that emissions uh, are dropping because of it. Uh, coal generation cr uh, creates twice as many emissions uh, as does um, natural gas. And so the fact that we saw such a drop-off uh, in 2012 there in the coal, sh the coal share of the generation mix meant that we saw emissions drop to the lowest level since the mid-90s. And so really, uh, coal is really the low-hanging fruit for us to low lower emissions here in the U.S., um, it's, it's really quite a, a remarkable situation that we're seeing going forward. The reason that it's focused so much on coal is because coal accounts for, uh, or power generation as a whole, accounts for 40% of, of emissions in the U.S. And so uh, really a, a, a huge element of the market there. Moving on, so uh, next up we're going to look at LNG. And so we are the Saudi Arabia of natural gas, but we just can't get it out of the country. Uh, and so that's why we're looking at something called LNG exports liquefied natural gas. Now, as this map shows you, uh, the, the, the U.S. is pretty well connected in terms of pipelines, uh, interstate, intrastate, but it's not like you can build a pipeline across the ocean to send gas to Europe or that. And so what has happened is now that we've realized that there's so much gas here in the U.S. Uh, that we can't get it out, prices are low, there is this sort of imbalance in place there, um, there is something called this LNG that we're going to freeze this natural gas to minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit. And when you do that, it turns it into a liquid. Uh, and the reason for doing that is because when it's in its liquid form, it is 600 times more dense uh, than in its gas form. And so it makes it conducive uh, for, for freezing it, popping it onto a tanker, uh, and sending it across the ocean, as you can see on this chart, on this, uh, this image here. Um, and so that's something that we are seeing. Um, so 10 years ago, the situation was very, very different in the U.S. Uh, we had a number of different LNG import terminals which were in place because we didn't know that we had all this gas under the ground. And so we were simply uh, building these import terminals to bring gas in from elsewhere so that we could be well supplied uh, in times of need. But as we've uh, realized we've got so much gas we don't know what to do with, 
these import terminals are being retrofitted to also become export terminals as well. And we're actually reaching a, a landmark in the coming uh, month or so where Sabine Pass, which is on the border of, sort of Texas and Louisiana, is going to start exporting LNG. Uh, now, that said, uh, there, a number of these terminals uh, are being retrofitted, but not as many as perhaps sort of uh, three, four years ago, simply because we've seen prices drop off so much uh, for LNG. And uh, we'll look at that on our next thing. Uh, which is global LNG getting crushed, number four. All right, so um, in terms of these exports, they made a lot more sense a few years ago uh, because the global market needed them. But um, LNG uh, export terminals uh, cost a lot of money to be built, tens of billions. Um, and they, they require regulatory um, hurdles to be cleared, and they also take a lot of time to be built as well. So... A number of these export terminals were planned a few years ago, and they all suddenly come to fruition at a time when they're not actually uh, needed anymore. And uh, the, the reason for that is, is twofold for, for supply and the demand side. And so in terms of the, uh, uh, the demand side, I'll touch on that first, what we've been seeing is, uh, is demand dropping off from somewhere like, uh, well, mainly from, from Asia. So in, in terms of actual LNG, uh, the global market, 75% of the global LNG market is Asia. 50% uh, of the global market is just two countries, South Korea and Japan. And then 35%, 35% of the global market is made up of one country, and that is Japan. And, uh, and so the, the reason for building these uh, export terminals and shipping it uh, across to Japan kind of made sense, as you can see from this chart here, when prices... Uh, for the spot LNG in Japan were over $20 in MMBTU. Um, what this chart shows you here as well, that red line, uh, that is U.S. prices, but it's also including uh, the, the transportation cost, the liquefaction cost, uh, which um, Angie uh, Julia Seward uh, equates to be about $5 in MMBTU, something like that. And so um, even early last year, it remained conducive for these guys to, to export LNG to Japan when they pay $20 in the BTU for it, um, uh, whereas uh, the U.S. is producing it for sort of $3, $4, and then that transportation cost. But uh, as we've seen here, a lot of uh, uh, the predominant amount of LNG contracts are based on oil, and so oil indexed contracts. And so as the oil price drop has come through, we have seen the price drop of LNG as well for Asia, and then suddenly it's not competitive, and you've had this slew of different export terminals coming to fruition uh, from, from Australia to Papua New Guinea, and there just isn't the demand for this stuff. Um, and the, the, the emphasis of, of low commodity prices is something that is a theme that will be going through next year, uh, from coal to oil to natural gas. It is really a, a worldwide uh, phenomenon uh, across these various commodities. Uh, but onto the Satchmo effect. All right. Um, I, I love uh, Mr. Louis Armstrong. I'd just like to take a second here just to pause, have a sip of uh, the water, and appreciate the, the joy in this picture. All right. Thank you. And the reason I bring up Mr. Uh, Mr. Louis Armstrong here and Ella Fitzgerald is because there is a wonderful song by the pair of these people these wonderful people, uh, called Let's Call the Whole Thing Off. And uh, in that song, they say, uh, you say tomato, uh, you say tomato, I say tomato. Um, yeah, I should be able to get that right, when you think. Um, and the reason I say this with this chart uh, in mind is because this is the U.S. dollar versus the oil market. Uh, and as you can see, they're, they're pretty much each other's arch nemesis, you know. They're, they're enemies. When one goes down, the other one goes up. And... Uh, the reason for that is uh, when the dollar drops, other countries have more buying power, and so uh, they can then purchase that oil or, or that copper or whatever that commodity may be. And so these two uh, work in birth to each other, and as you can see here, it really is very much like a mirror. That said, you're now in a situation here in the U.S., or, or we were even just a year or a bit ago, uh, when we were looking at uh, interest rates potentially being raised in the U.S., uh, and and that really spurred on about a U.S. dollar strength coming through. Uh, and because of that, we saw the, that, that downward uh, pressure put on the crude market. 
So here we are in November, looking ahead to December, uh, with an 80%, 70% likelihood, something like that, of interest rates being hiked in the U.S. And so if, if that is going to happen, that is going to uh, uh, give strength to the dollar and therefore provide headwinds for crude going through into uh, 2016. So whatever else you think about uh, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, or, uh, or the oil market, uh, if you think the dollar is going to rise or you think its interest rates are coming, then that's going to pressure them lower. Ah, chocolate strawberries. Moving on. Okay, oil boom gloom. Okay, what you see here is uh, this is production of oil in the U.S. right from the very beginning, the first well drilled in Titusville, Pennsylvania there. And then you've seen it actually ramp up uh, to record levels sort of uh, in the 19, uh, early 1970s. And then you've seen U.S. oil production drop right off and then phew, shoot for the stars uh, in the last few years. And this has really only come through from a, a few shell plates and from uh, a few different states. Um, the reason this has happened, essentially, is because you have OPEC, uh, this cartel, who, who have um, basically been in control of the market for a good number of decades. And so when oil prices have got too high, uh, they've, um, they've put more supply onto the market. And when oil prices have got too low, they've taken oil off the market to support prices. Um, but then there's been a sudden situation where the U.S. has filled the market with oil and suddenly OPEC doesn't have any power. They are not that free producer anymore. And so rather than take oil off the market and make room for the U.S. here, uh, they've said, no, nope, we're going to go after the most high-cost production, regardless of who that may be. And because of that, we've seen oil prices drop in the last year from over $115, something like $114 back in June last year, uh, now down to as low as 40 ish And so, but... We are finally starting to see production tailing off here. We got up to sort of 9.6 uh, million barrels a day earlier in this year, and now we're starting to see this move lower. And so um, the, the impact of what OPEC has done uh, in terms of flooding the market um, and, and just trying to let free markets rule uh, it, uh, is really having its desired effect, and that will likely play out through next year as we see this oil production tailing off here in the U.S. Okay, and these are the key shell plays. As I mentioned, is they're only coming through from a, a few of these. Two states, uh, three shell plays. The key ones is Barkin, uh, up in North Dakota there. Uh, and then you have Permian and Eagleford, which are the, uh, the other two main ones, uh, Texas. And we just had the drilling productivity report um, yesterday uh, from the EIA, Department of Energy. Uh, and, and their projection is that by next month, Eagleford oil production will be down 25% from the peak that we saw um, earlier in the year. And so uh, the impact is, is potentially starting to bite uh, in terms of uh, these lower prices. But um, I really do think that the U.S. may prove to, to be much more resilient than people believe. Uh, and we, we should see, uh, should prices rise, we will see a nimble response by producers as they're doing cost-cutting, efficiency gains, uh, and, and really being uh, a, a extremely resourceful. Okay, does this mean uh, uh, doom for natural gas then because of the gloom in oil? Well, well, kind of. Uh, it does look kind of similar, this chart here, in that um, natural gas production has been ramping up from these unconventional shale plays uh, because essentially there have been this afterthought coming through from, uh, from oil production. So the 25% of natural gas production in the U.S. is associated gas coming from oil plays or from uh, liquid plates. And so what you're seeing here is, uh, is a number of different areas uh, really ramping up because of that. And as we're starting to see signs of those slowing, we're seeing that actually coming through in the production side of things as well. But um, yes, we are seeing Marcellus drop off now, uh, which isn't associated uh, per se with that, that oil production. Uh, but as you see infrastructure built out there, we should see that level off start to tick higher again. Even the Haynesville, this kind of mustardy color here, uh, which was so strong a few years ago, has, has seen production drop off as rigs have moved, been moved elsewhere. But what you're likely going to see is because of uh, technological development, those break-evens are dropping, uh, and we should see uh, production increasing from, from there as well going forward. And so uh, you really are seeing um, the U.S. market adjusting um, to be able to, to take account uh, for these pricing pressures that we are seeing. 
Um, so that's it. That's really su- the supply side of things. In terms of demand, U.S. consumption continues to rip higher and will likely do so going forward. And so this is another thing for next year where we're going to see um, demand coming through from not only the power generation side, as we looked at in terms of um, what we're seeing from, from beating out coal in the generation mix, uh, but also industrial demand will likely continue to increase in the coming years. Uh, and also LNG exports, as we mentioned, and also uh, Mexican exports by pipeline. Um, all of these things are going to mean that natural gas consumption is going to continue to increase, all taking advantage of these lower prices that we are seeing. So are we seeing a study in global economy? That is something that is a real worry that we'll see next year. Uh, and you can see signs of it already really coming through, uh, specifically from China. China is a sponge uh, for, for natural resources. Uh, as you can see from this chart, it's basically saying that the China is the largest consumer of aluminum to nickel to copper to zinc to tin to steel to uh, con, et cetera. Just, uh, goes, the list goes on and on. China consumes 50% of the world's coal, uh, which is just in, insanity to me. Um, but we are starting to see uh, signs of, of weakness in terms of their commodity demand, not just from uh, energy perspectives such as coal, but from, from elsewhere. And uh, this is really um, starting to weigh on the global economy. Just last night, they had their inflation numbers out, which was soft. Uh, it's, again, another concern. Uh, China, you know, second largest uh, uh, economy in the world, uh, is really starting to weigh on things. And so uh, the, the impact of the slowing economy here is, is really sending a ripple across the world. Um, this chart is a little bit wonkish, but it's, um, it, it helps me make my point. Uh, this is from the IMF. And so... Uh, uh, this is their revisions uh, to their, their economic outlooks from their last report, which was out in April. And the key takeaway from here is that there's downward revisions across the board, but they're also coming through from these commodity-rich countries. All paths lead back to energy uh, and also uh, to commodities in, generally, uh, in general. Sorry. And so in terms of uh, just Brazil there, uh, it is not only a, a large oil producer, but also cocoa, soybeans, etc. And so as uh, emerging markets slow demand from China, so their goods slows, and uh, they're getting hurt. Same with the Canadian economy, resource rich uh, is, is really getting hurt by uh, the, the drop in prices in terms of commodities. So overall, the picture uh, is relatively a little glum for, uh, for the world economy going forward, uh, stuttering along around this sort of 3 percentage level. The sunny side of the street, once more, let's just have a look at that famous Mr. Satchmo there. I'll take a sip of water. All right, great song, The Sunny Side of the Street. The uh, reason I, I bring it up is because um, although I've gone on about natural gas and coal fighting things out, uh, we are starting to see a real impact coming through from, from wind uh, and from solar in the U.S. Uh, we, are start, we will be seeing that going through next year, capacity additions for the two of those, uh, really going to be leading the charge versus natural gas uh, in the coming years, uh, and that is uh, obviously a, a good thing. Um, but on the overall picture here, it really isn't that large a share of the actual generation mix, uh, just because there's such a reliance on, on baseload need here. And um, so even though, like, Texas just a few weeks ago got um, sort of a uh, predominant amount of its needs from wind, uh, and you're seeing really ramping up in California, as we'll see in the next slide of that, for these various renewables, uh, on, on a, uh, a national scale, we're not seeing... Uh, uh, renewables relied on as much as, say, we are as in Europe. You know, natural gas is still this bridge fuel to a renewable future. That said, you are seeing uh, on, a, on a subsidized basis um, about a third of uh, the states in the U.S. really competing with coal and gas uh, in terms of uh, uh, cost. And that is, a, that is a great, great thing. As you can see, though, all 52, those little gray bars, all 52, uh, 52 all 50 states, um, are above um, the, the level of coal and gas there, and so they are not cost competitive. But the key thing is they are getting there. And so um, uh, we'll see this coming through next year with the capacity additions, but also going forward, as, as again, this theme that I keep mentioning, technological development, uh, it will keep on driving uh, the energy complex forward. And uh, it's not going to be too long uh, before the, we see these really being cost competitive. We're already seeing a great effort by California here. Um, they're targeting uh, 30% uh, 
uh, of their generation mix by 2020 to come from renewables, which they are likely to do. Just last year, they got up to over 5% of it from solar, uh, over 6% of it from wind. And, uh, and because uh, they're going to knock it out of the park and get that 30% by 2020, they're upping the ante and putting it up to um, uh, 50% renewables uh, by 2030. And so there are pockets of real success in terms of renewables uh, across the U.S., and that will continue. But the interesting thing for me here is that wind, uh, I mentioned about Texas with, with wind generation there. Um, the EIA, this is from the EIA, they predict that by 2050, wind power is going to be the leading source of generation in the U.S., which is really quite surprising to me because I would have thought that would have been coming through uh, from, from solar. Uh, and, and on a global scale, I think that will be the case, or it could be the case by 2050, uh, in, uh, with a, my most optimistic hat on my head. Uh, we could be seeing uh, solar leading the way, uh, definitely probably by 2080, something like that. But uh, here in the U.S., wind is going to be leading the charge by 2050. Pretty surprising. Okay. So, finally, we get to low gas, number 10 here, uh, your trend for next year. Finish on a high note. All right. So, chirpy, chirpy, cheek, cheek. Uh, that's, uh, that's from the Eurovision Song Contest, uh, uh, an unfortunate reference that you guys probably don't get. Um, but what you can see here is the green shows uh, areas where the retail price of gasoline is under $2.10. And so at the moment, the swath of low gasoline prices uh, is, is really having a, a huge benefit uh, in terms of savings in the U.S. and in terms of consumer spending. Um, we've, we've spent the last three years with gasoline prices averaging about $3.50, so 12, 2013 and 14. This year, they're well below $2.50 on the average for the entire year, uh, and that is an excellent thing. Uh, we're going to have another month or so of these low prices. They always generally tend to bottom out at the end of the year. Uh, but as you can see from this, uh, South Carolina is already uh, seeing a, a national uh, uh, an average there of 185. Even California, who historically has paid through the nose for their gas, um, they're at like $2.80, and that will continue to edge lower. And so we could get down to sort of 2.10 on the national average by the end of the next month. And so uh, that is that's a that is a pretty cool thing. And um, just uh, these savings are being seen uh, across the board. Uh, we, we consume sort of 400 million gallons of gasoline each day. And so that dollar less versus last year per gallon means there's $400 million swishing around uh, in, in our pockets uh, that wasn't there this time last year. That said, those pesky refiners uh, have been uh, still making out like bandits. Uh, the, the low oil price environment hasn't impacted them because their profitability has held up and they have really made the most of these low prices and really uh, if all things being equal uh, we would have likely have seen uh, lower gasoline prices if we'd seen the, the same drop that we should have seen with that oil price move there because inevitably crude oil makes up the sort of 60 percent of the, the move in the gasoline price but anyway so with these low prices do not do this. Do not go out and buy an SUV. This is what is actually happening. We're seeing SUV sales picking up. Rather than uh, saving uh, money, spending it elsewhere, people are buying SUVs. Please do not do that. Please do save money. This is a, a theme that has been uh, prevalent this year where people have been paying down credit cards. Do go out and eat with your friends. There's a good thing to do. Do go to the grocery store. Uh, and then finally, uh, do do cartwheels. Uh, it's not actually relevant to, to gasoline prices, but it's a uh, a very exhilarating thing to do. Um, so with that, uh, my 30 minutes are up. And uh, thank you very much for listening uh, to me rant. I'll be around at the end to answer questions. Uh, but with that, I'll hand back to you, Mike. Thanks, Matt. Thank you for your energy and your passion. Uh, I appreciate it. But more importantly, the great information and the entertaining slides that you provided. So we appreciate that. I will now turn it over to uh, Jeffrey and Ken. Uh, thanks, Mike. This is Jeffrey Levine. I'm going to be sharing the next few slides with my colleague, Ken. The slide you're looking at now is a snapshot of some very interesting things that I wanted you to see. I think we've heard a lot about retirements because of uh, environmental regulations, but really PGM is quite long since 2007. So if you think of over the last nine years, about 40 gigawatts have been added and 34 have retired. Now, 
some areas in PJM might have shortages because the retirements are in certain constrained areas, but overall, PJM is long. Next point I wanted you to think about was um, how the future system mix of generation might change as different states or even the federal government through the Environmental Protection Agency consider ways to um, increase fuel diversity and um, put certain environmental limitations on current generation. Um, what we do know is that the Environmental Protection Agency has a carbon reduction plan in draft form that is out there. Um, we've already been responding to environmental regulations in the past, but I think the carbon reduction plan is something that really could change the way electricity is dispatched by an ISO because of the uh, severe environmental limitations it would put. And the, the current model is the economic economic dispatch model, but we might see something that challenges it and a very different system mix and a very different uh, dispatch model going forward. The other point is about forecasted peak and average usage. Now, both are positive, but not by much, approximately 1%, um, and that's not as high as prior year forecasts. And I, and I think it's worth thinking about why that's the case. There has been a large push for um, distributed generation like solar and battery and um, big efforts on energy efficiency and demand response. And some might argue it is because of the um, potential of those new fields that forecasted consumption is so much lower. But it's not clear that that is the case. So really you have to wonder, and I don't think there's one answer here, do we just have as an economy less energy intensive industries? Do we have more efficient appliances, regardless of whether the consumer is got behind the meter generation or into conservation, are the appliances we're buying just more efficient? And then really with scarcity pricing, which is spikes in pricing during times of constraint on the system, do we have increased sensitivities? to scarcity pricing where more and more people are just deciding not to consume as much during those hottest of hot days. So it's not um, clear that DR, DG, and EE is analogous to the telecom scenario in which cell phones are pretty much replacing landlines. So I think the jury is still out on whether those smaller distributed generation uh, sources are replacing um, central generation that we have today. The only other thing I wanted to notice is the wheel to the right. It gives a nice snapshot. I pulled it from PJM itself of what the current system mix is made of. And as you can see, nuclear is considerable, coal is um, the majority, and then you have natural gas at 17%, and a lot of others, hydro, um, some renewables, some oil. Um, like I mentioned with the carbon plan to reduce emissions, you might see nuclear take a bigger position and coal take a smaller position. And the big unknown, and I think we heard a lot about this from Matt, is what natural gas will do in the future. Next slide, please. So why am I talking to you about a winter day almost two years ago? The reason is the polar vortex is responsible for almost all of the major policy changes that we're going to talk about in the capacity market and in the energy market. Most of them have come from a response to what happened during the polar vortex. So here's a snapshot of one day. This is a slide put together by PJM after it studied those days. You saw an increased outage rate, 22% system-wide instead of the historical average of 7%. The causes were severe cold needing generators to run longer than they typically do, and interruptions in both natural gas and fuel oil delivery, fuel oil being a common backup fuel to natural gas. If you look at the next two bullets, 42% of the forced outages were due to equipment failures, meaning we really hadn't been testing our units, not GDFs, but the systems units during winter conditions. That's something that's changed since this time. And also, if you look at the next bullet, most of the outages were in um, natural gas and coal-fired megawatts. Um, so here you have just a snapshot that you can look at at your own time, but I really wanted you to see that you had a severe system failure across the fuel supply, fuel delivery, generator um, uh, behavior, and uh, physical equipment tolerances. Next slide, please. So 
what came out of this? Just to focus on the new capacity market design called capacity performance. So earlier this summer, on June, the, in June, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission approved the new capacity performance market. It calls for enhanced delivery criteria, improved operations. You have to have firmer fuel supply arrangements if you're a generator. There will be higher clearing prices because all of those costs to do those things are going to be reflected in generators' capacity bids, but there will be severe penalties. And just to give you a sense of the balance, the penalties can be one and a half times the revenue. So a generator could actually lose much more than it was making by participating and failing to deliver. They must be capable of sustained, predictable operation so that when PJM determines an emergency condition exists, they are there. And really, if people are wondering, well, why doesn't that exist today? I think what PJM learned was its system had been um, optimized for a summer peaking system. The engineering that went into each plant was to maximize performance during the summer. And what we've learned is that uh, PJM is seeing a shift to winter peaking and kind of thinking of a, a convertible being converted into an SUV with snow tires, you had to do a lot of things to the fleet to get it ready for the cold. So when PJM says whenever there's an emergency, they mean in any hour that I call a generator, that generator has to be there. It could be six hours in a row. It could be 20 hours in a row. It could be three days in a row. You have to have the fuel, you have to have the staffing, and you have to have the operational consistency to meet those or you will be penalized severely. So the other quick points, effective June 2020, only capacity performance megawatts will be participating in the capacity market. We're in a transition right now where for this First 1617 and 1718 auctions, we already had regular capacity, but we just did incremental auctions to add a certain amount of this higher level capacity performance. And that's what the incremental auctions were, just to add the capacity performance to the existing base. We did just have the base residual auction for 1819, and the next one, that's for 1920, will be a split. 80% of this higher level performance capacity and 20% of the standard old stuff. But again, by 2020, everything is capacity performance. The only thing I want people to be aware of, and this is an interesting point, I'm not sure how it will play out, but there is a potential for increased self-scheduling by generators. And basically what that means is a generator will not wait for PJM to dispatch it, but might say, I would like to start up on my own and be running already if I fear or think an emergency hour could happen and I have any question about whether I'll start up or trip offline, whether I'll have any operational problems, I'd much rather start early and make sure I'm running and up to speed in case there is one of these emergency hours because it's in that emergency hour that I have to perform. So if a generator decides to self-schedule, then PJM would have to ramp down some of the more economic units that had been given a day-ahead award the day prior. So whenever you imagine a day-ahead award being given to a generator and then that generator does not run in real time, there's the potential for make-whole payments that are out of market. Sometimes we call them uplift, and they're very difficult to predict. They're not transparent, and they're not hedgeable. So that's something that we think is the scourge of, of the market are these out-of-market make whole payments, and we've been working with PJM to address that, and I think everyone agrees that the limit is limiting these charges, potential charges, is important, but I wanted everyone to be aware that there's a potential for increased self-scheduling, which could have a domino effect on uplift and make whole payments. Next slide, please. Thanks, Jeffrey. Uh, this is Ken McMahon. I'm going to uh, take you through the next couple slides. And as Mike mentioned earlier, I, 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 I handle the pricing and portfolio management for our, our PJM region. Um, so the final auction timeline for the transition to uh, um, uh, capa the capacity performance construct was that 
the planning year 1819 base residual auction for which there had there had not uh, been a prior capacity price set was was going to be the first auction held uh, on uh, August 21st and then there were going to that was going to be f followed by a series of two transition auctions um, one for planning year 1617 on August 31st and another for planning year 1718 on September 9th. Now there ha there had already been base residual auctions held uh, um, for 1617 and 1718. So 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 um, there was already a set of pre-capacity performance performance uh, auction results available. So as a company. Um, uh, once the capacity performance construct was approved and we were contemplating how we would handle capacity performance both from a contractual standpoint and from a forward pricing standpoint, we, we approached it with sort of two overriding concerns. Um, one was uh, attempting to, to minimize the cost impact for our customers. And two, uh, um, uh, and the second was to be as transparent as possible with the marketplace as to how we were going to um, deal with this, this very um, significant market event. And so uh, where we came down uh, on it was since, since, uh, since there was already, uh, if you will, a baseline capacity auction price available for planning year 16, 17, and 17, 18, um, after after FERC approved the uh, uh, the capacity performance construct, uh, we we added some contract language uh, to our our contracts that said for for the two uh, the two transition uh, auction periods, um, we were going to pass through um, the difference between uh, the, the the final capacity performance price and 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 the previously established uh, price established in the the the, the base uh, the base residual auction um, because we 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 felt uh, we did a lot of lobbying with PJM that we could uh, be very transparent in in quantifying uh, that. Uh, that value and would not have to add any unnecessary risk premiums um, uh, uh, to, to establish that that value. But for the the planning year 1819 period, um, where there was no previously established um, uh, auction price held, we thought the prudent thing to do uh, was to uh, responsibly uh, price in as best we could um, expected capacity costs. Um, for 18, 19, and, and periods beyond. So once uh, w once the transition auctions cleared, um, the, uh, the the transition auctions established um, up up uh, basically capacity performance uplift rates um, for each of the transition years. Um, for planning year 1617, that uplift rate was $38.17 a megawatt day, and for 1718, $27.69 a megawatt day. And that that is uh, those uplift rates um, are the same across all zones in PJM. So it, do, it doesn't matter whether you're in uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, or or Illinois. Um, uh, the, the 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 cost impact um, of capacity performance uh, the capacity performance uplift is is identical, and then uh, of course once the once the transition auctions uh, cleared, um, we immediately uh, reflected um, the, the transition auction clearing prices in our, in our forward pricing from that from that point forward. So what's 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 the approximate cost impact, say on a dollars per megawatt hour, of these uh, of, of these this capacity performance uplift cost, and then and, and the, the the chart there below shows for for various load factors um, uh, what the approximate uplift uh, would be on a on a bundled capacity rate. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, so other than other than the, the uh, 
a potential for improved generator availability. Um, what 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 else might what other benefits might load have uh, have bought for all this extra cost that 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 is being paid for under the capacity performance construct, and 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 one of the um, you know one of the results of of the the polar vortex winner is that there, there, uh, forward pricing um, in PJM there was a, a, a very significant winter premium established in particular in the mid Atlantic region. So where, where, whereas prior to the polar vortex uh, summer pricing the summer months of July and August were always the premium months post polar vortex. Um, January and February were, were 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 viewed as the, as the most risky and and and, and therefore the, the most potentially expensive months. So as as uh, as uh, you know, one potential benefit of of capacity performance um, that I see is 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 as the market gets comfortable that that generators will be uh, responding um, to the potential penalties and and requirements of capacity performance. That that I, I believe we will start to see some of this uh, uh, sharp winter premium um, bleed out of the market going forward. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is Jeffrey again. So another development in the energy market is that PJM asked the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to waive the one thousand dollar per megawatt hour energy cap rule. Now, PJM had done this in the two past winters since the polar vortex. They had asked for temporary waivers where prices would be allowed to go up to $1,800. But there are two things that make this a little different. One, they picked $2,000 a megawatt hour. It's not temporary. It is permanent. And it's happening in the context of a broader national look at price formation. The Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has opened up an investigation that will include um, ISO New England, New York ISO, PJM, MISO, Cal ISO, and they will be asking each of these ISOs and others to address price formation questions. And so with PJM leading the way with $2,000, to some degree it's putting a marker out there. Now, the FERC has not yet responded, and we don't really know where this will go, but this is something PJM has asked for in preparation of this upcoming winter. Now, one item that I think is worth noting is that the goal is to reflect all generator costs in the LMP and to avoid out-of-market make-whole payments to generators that are recovered through uplift charges to load. So currently, when, when you did have in PJM during the polar vortex some clearing prices that were over $1,000, which at the time was the cap, anything over 1000 that was allowed to be recovered had to be recovered through an uplift charge to load. So increasing the cap to 2000 has the potential to make all of the charges flow through the LMP bucket and avoid this out of market make whole payment. Yeah, and this is Ken again. Just one further comment. You know, one of you know one of the you know potential uh, scary um, thoughts of, of of raising a uh, raising a, 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 a an energy cap is that is that you know there could be a, a perception that prices might naturally gravitate. Uh, Towards that that higher cap, um, and, and so uh, what, what we are attempting to just provide some some level of comfort with this chart below is is as we went and we looked back over the past four years and and sort of uh, bucketed prices um, in, in in five different uh, tranches, uh, you, you know, under a hundred dollars, one hundred to two fifty, two fifty to five hundred, and so forth. Um, and, and what you can see is that is that even uh, with the with the energy cap at a thousand dollars, the vast majority of of 
of hourly LMPs are are, are still under under a hundred dollars, and, and and generally quite a bit under under a hundred dollars, um, and 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 really very few intervals actually reach the level of above five hundred dollars, and and even over the past four years, um, the intervals that that were concentrated in that. $500 and above range were during the polar vortex winter of 2014. So, so just wanted to provide some level of comfort that ju that just because the, the 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 energy cap is getting raised, uh, th th there shouldn't be any 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 sense that that prices that that that'll have uh, uh, the increase the likelihood, if you will, that prices will will rise to that that new energy cap level. Next slide. So um, back to the energy market. How did we pick $1,000? No one really remembers, to be honest. So it's starting to feel quite arbitrary as to what number we should pick if it's not going to be a $1,000 per megawatt hour uh, energy bid cap. But sometimes that is just how policy is going to be set, and we will be keeping our eye on that. One of the things that we want to make sure is that we don't have any curious import-export impacts with neighboring ISOs. So you can imagine, I, I think MISO is coming up with $1,500. PJM proposed $2,000. New York feels right now quite comfortable sticking at $1,000, and ISO New England is watching everybody. If you have different ISOs that border each other with different caps, well, you could have some very interesting flows back and forth across the line as a generator in a cheaper market tries to sell into a constrained emergency time in a more expensive market, and that could really challenge reliability. And as you get influxes of unexpected generation, PGM might, to maintain reliability, have to um, um, ramp down some of the generators that had a day ahead award. And again, when someone has a day ahead award and doesn't run to that commitment in real time, there's a potential for make whole payments, and that means uplift to load. So there's some things we do have to be um, concerned about. Also, as you move towards um, um, the net cone, the net cost of new entry, which is a key indicator in the capacity market curves that they establish, um, how much money you make from the energy market is considered. So if you're making more money in the energy market, then potentially the capacity market curves will come down. But that's something that's more of a long-term overview. As I said earlier, I do think it's important to have all of the costs in the LMP. It is something that can be hedged. Just to note, I think we might have lost audio, so we are going to pause for a second. If ever, uh, it sounds like we're back up, so excuse me for that. Um, but as I was saying, I think it's important, and I think everybody wants a transparent market where all costs are reflected in the LMP, and we can avoid um, um, uplift, and we can use our hedging tools for a more efficient market. Two other quick things that are coming up in 2016 that I think everyone should be aware of. Uh, generators might be given the ability to submit hourly, differentiated, and intraday bidding, meaning if there are gas price blowouts or there are emergency constraints, generators, if this is approved, would be able to change their bid prices to reflect any constraints in, in fuel supply or any blowouts in prices to better align how a generator buys its fuel and how a better generator bids its um, electricity and at what cost. And that's something that's being developed and we'll be watching for 2016. Also, scarcity pricing, as I had said before, what PJM is really looking to do is increase the amount of reserves it needs to maintain reliability, and it has added higher prices to those shortage events so that in moments of scarcity, prices reflect that and hopefully it can incentivize more efficient operations. Next slide, please. Hi, this is, uh, this is Ken again. And, and, and so one of the other uh, uh, proposals that was actually originally in the capacity performance construct but was, it was, was pulled out before the final version was approved was a, a change in the, in the, the methodology by, uh, by which uh, capacity charges were allocated back to load. Um, so uh, for, the, for the second year in a row now, PJM has set new winter peaks 
of approximately 143 gigawatts. And 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 actually these these winter these winter peaks were were the highest peaks of the entire year, um, eclipsing those uh, set in the summer. So historically, PJM has always viewed itself as a as a summer peaking uh, region. So th th this is this is. Uh, uh, led to led to proposals that per, perhaps allocating uh, capacity costs based on um, a five coincident peak methodology with those five CP hours set during the summer, um, perhaps a more um, equitable way to do it and one that reflects um, the the that that's that some of the uh, highest hours will could potentially be in the winter. Um, would be a change in the methodology, and so perhaps, and, and the methodology I think is, is still in play. But uh, some of, some of the proposals have been maybe we have four summer CPs and one winter CP. Um, in addition, uh, perhaps um, there's additional uh, uh, hours added to the calculation when PJM is in emergency operations. And, and really, the, the, whatever the, the the allocation methodology, the you know the goal of you know the, the thought process is that uh, PJM wants to incentivize loads to uh, curtail or to you know minimize their usage during the, the peak times. And if those peak times uh, happen to fall in the winter, or especially when PJM's in emergency operations, um, that, that that would be a prudent uh, that could be a prudent path forward. So, so while that sounds uh, good from a, a policy standpoint, there's some some very profound potential impacts to that. Uh, the, the the most important being that it, it, it's it's a material cost shift away from uh, basically from summer peaking loads to winter peaking loads. Um, with 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 winter if, with any cost methodology that that incorporates a, a winter coincident peak. Um, a, a, a major cost shift uh, would be going on there, um, and 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 I guess from a more uh, you know nuts and bolts retail perspective, it, it it makes it much more difficult and risky to fix capacity um, uh, costs on a go forward basis because at least currently. Um, suppliers know the methodology. They know that they can look at a customer's summer usage uh, and, and and what they do, what they typically do d during potential five CP hours, and 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 that method and and those those five CP hours don't change year to year. Um, if we got into some sort of uh, construct where one year it was five summer peaks, the next year it was three summer peaks and two winter peaks. Um, or, or, or some other methodology um, that that calculate that that calculation becomes uh, much more difficult and risky to project on a go forward basis, and and again it would make it make it much more difficult and risky for suppliers to fix capacity costs under under such a regime. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thanks. Just wanted to bring everyone up to speed on some of the efforts that are happening in the states that I would consider out-of-market efforts. So within the state of Ohio, uh, two utilities, AEP and First Energy, as part of both of their rate cases before the State of Ohio Commission, have asked for a wires or delivery charge rider um, to pay for utility affiliate company-owned generation, so AEP generation or first energy services, and they've identified the generating units. It adds up between the two of them to about 6.5 gigawatts or 6,500 megawatts, so it's, it's considerable. And if approved, um, the subsidies would force all Ohio consumers to pay for generation in a way twice once through the socialized uh, delivery service charges, and then a second through whatever their supplier of choice was charging them. So in general, we think that's an out-of-market charge, um, and, and it's something to keep an eye on. Um, you know, when you, when you keep non-competitive generation in the market um, for uh, 
economic development or jobs reasons other than reliability, you, you kind of undermine the ability of the market to be competitive, to reflect pricing the way it should, um, and it delays the deployment of more efficient resources that could actually over, overall trend um, energy prices down. Now, the EPA Clean Power Plan, as I'd mentioned earlier, um, is an effort to reduce carbon, and it does um, change the approach to nuclear power plants that are struggling economically. There are power plants in Illinois and in Ohio, in Pennsylvania and in New York and in New England and in New Jersey that have, and you can read it in the press, all struggled with energy clearing prices, have all struggled with bidding into the capacity market um, in their respective regions and being uh, accepted into those capacity markets, and they've made it known to their local, uh, local ISOs and RTOs that they are considering other options. Now, because these are large employers and because they are large volume suppliers, it's something you have to take note of. Now, why would nuclear be different than any of the other distressed generation? And I think the answer might be because of the clean power plant. And it's not clear to me, but I think it's worth wondering about that does the EPA Clean Power Plan, with its focus on carbon reduction, put nuclear in a very different category than just any generation? So, for example, in the state of Illinois, there's been legislation to expand the renewable portfolio standard um, actually to something called a non-carbon portfolio standard. And in doing so, you would have the renewable energy credits and you know, all the other uh, revenue streams that go f with a renewable portfolio standard that would now include non-carbon emitting sources. Now, while that might be something no one really thought about, it, it forces you to consider how um, a carbon reduction policy could really affect the kinds of generation we have in the fleet, whether states can meet their implementation plans for these carbon reduction goals without drastic economic measures, I think most states that have nuclear power in them would like that nuclear power to stay online because it goes a long way to helping that state meet carbon reduction plans. Next slide, please. Just to wrap things up, I wanted to point out some things that are happening in the distributed generation world. and really highlight that it's not a system-wide effort. And you're going to end up with a series of initiatives that might end up looking like a quilt or a patchwork quilt, I should say, as each state wrestles with decentralization in energy production at its own pace. So there are some states, and I'm going to go through this quickly, that are wondering if we're going to have behind-the-meter generation, whether it be solar or fuel cell or battery, what size should we allow? Can it be very big or should it stay small? What fuel types should we focus on? Different states focus on different fuel types. Solar first, but maybe not battery. And siting. What are the rules going to be for communities, whether they are suburban cul-de-sacs or town centers or farm areas, and where do we allow this kind of generation to go? Net metering, a subject we've probably all heard about. Well, some utilities feel that there needs to be a cap on the amount of net metering because there are cost concerns and a difficulty in managing people's settlements and bills. Community or shared renewable net metering. You're hearing a lot more about states investigating whether they should allow larger scale renewables, typically solar, to have virtual net metering to a lot of different consumers, even if those consumer groups aren't physically located with that renewable resource. Sometimes policy initiatives want to cover low income that are traditionally the, the last group to take advantage of net metering and renewables. Sometimes they want it to be part of economic development or emergency needs. So I know, for instance, there are places that say, if you're going to propose a net meet, virtual net metering community solar, it's got to include low income housing, a hospital, a fire department, a police department, and maybe some economic development downtown where some businesses benefit from this. So you've got some very d interesting but different initiatives across the country on that. And obviously, once we get to an area where more distributed generation is, is apparent, you're going to have a lot of issues with data. How do we access 
usage data, what security measures are around that data, and how do you actually get customer authorization to use that data. So that with um, the schedule for advanced meter deployment are just some of the issues that are happening at a state level that could very much change a lot of the market fundamentals we've been talking about. I think that's years away, and interestingly, it's not being coordinated at a federal or even a regional level. Next slide. Thanks, Jeffrey and Ken, for all your input and in all these PGM-related hot topics. Nice job. Now we've concluded our presentation. I would like to turn it over to Danielle Wilkes to lead our Q&A session. Thanks, Mike. Hi, everybody. This is Danielle Wilkes, and as Mike mentioned, I'm the Regional Vice President of Sales for the PGM Mid-Atlantic Market. Today I'll also be your moderator for the Q&A session. At this time, we are now ready to begin answering some of your questions. So for those of you online with us today, you can submit a question by clicking on the green Q&A icon on the lower left-hand side of the screen, type your question in the open area, and then click Submit. As you all know, we're a little bit late, I'm running a little bit over time here, but we're willing to answer a few questions. We'd like to get some of those in, so feel free to send in your questions, and we'll take it um, as we go and hopefully finish up probably within the next 15 minutes if you guys want to hang on with us. So with it, that, let's get started. Um, let me see what questions we have. Okay, first question. So, uh, Matt, this is going to be for you. Do okay. you see oil prices rising soon, and could OPEC take action to support prices? Um, OPEC could take action soon to support prices, but they're not going to. Uh, they, they've kept their same tack all year, uh, where they're, they're keeping production elevated, um, they're being hurt by these low oil prices, but uh, they're in this for the long haul, and specifically Saudi Arabia. Uh, we're going to be seeing Iran returning uh, to the market as well with more barrels next, early next year, and so um, nothing's going to change from the OPEC side of things. So on that basis, uh, I don't see oil prices rising any any time uh, soon. Uh, we may get, you know, sort of these intermittent rallies to up to test for the $50, something like that, but uh, by no means are we going to be charging up $60, $70. Even if we did get up through into the, the 50s, you'd see a supply response by uh, the U.S. to bring more supply back onto the market, and so that's really keeping a lid on prices um, uh, while bargain hunting really stops us from, from dropping through 40 at least at the moment. Okay. All right. Thanks, Matt. Let's see. I actually have another one that, while I still have you live here, <laughs> let's give me this, uh -huh. let me give you this one too. So, could the U.S. Okay. export too much natural gas and inadvertently lift prices much higher? I think that was definitely a concern a few years ago, uh, but the, the situation is, has completely reversed itself, completely changed, and and I think now it's uh, it's, it's going to be a case of is there going to be the market for the, the LNG exports that come online in the coming years? And so um, I don't think there's going to be too much impact on prices. The most bullish scenario from the supply side of things is that we see uh, over 9 BCF a day of capacity come online uh, by sort of 2019. But the way things are looking, uh, demand is going, uh, supply is going to be outpacing demand from elsewhere, and so it, we really shouldn't see uh, too much of a price impact on the U.S., no. Okay. Thanks. All right, how about we switch over to Ken? I think we have a couple questions here for you, Ken, that I think you can answer. So the first one, uh, the comment is, I believe change in law for capacity performance for PJM planning years 16, 17, and 17, 18 is clear cut, but there seems to be a debate on planning year 18, 19. Does GDF Suez intend to pass through capacity performance costs for planning year 18, 19? Uh, yeah, I'll take that one. Um, so, so I, I guess uh, number one, as far as 16 and 17 go, um, I'll make the comment that I, I think I think it's it's clear cut um, only for uh, only for contracts signed um, before September 9th when those uh, transition auctions cleared. I, I believe that any any contract signed after those transition auctions cleared should fully reflect. Um, uh, capacity performance costs. As far as 1819 goes, uh, Suez does not intend to pass through capacity performance costs for 1819. And, and as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, we we took that path because we didn't see any 
uh, even remotely transparent way that we could do that since there was no base residual auction um, sort of baseline price, um, how could we, there was really no way to quantify um, uh, how, you, how, how you could value just the capacity performance um, piece of, of whatever capacity cost was, was included in the original contract price. So um, for, you, for you buyers out there, I'd, 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 I'd be very, uh, uh, be very skeptical and, 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 and press your suppliers uh, that are attempting to pass through costs for 1819 exactly what they used as their baseline capacity costs that, that were included in the original, the original contract price. All right, thanks, Ken. Um, give me one second. Okay, so the next question that we have here is, if you think the clean power plan will give nuclear generation a spotlight, do you think the expected nuclear retirements, for example, Fitzpatrick in New York, will be delayed? Uh, hi, this is Jeffrey. I think that's a, a great question. And um, the specifics around the Fitzpatrick nuclear plant are such that I don't believe there'll be a delay. Um, it's an oversupplied area of New York. It's connected to the backbone transmission system, so you're not going to have any locational areas with feeder lines. And um, it just might be one that is allowed to go. Now, having said that, um, the governor of New York has in the past used reliability must-run style contracts to keep certain generation operating for the sole purpose of economic development and job creation. Um, so with that political uncertainty, it's always possible. But I think more likely, if we're going to look at beyond Fitzpatrick, more likely you would see states submitting implementation plans to the EPA that include some kind of local mechanism for pricing fuel diversity. And that would be the way that nuclear power plants that are economically distressed find new revenue streams to stay in operation. All right. Thanks, Jeffrey. Okay, the next question we have, Ken McMahon, I think this is a good one for you. Um, with long-term energy prices looking attractive, how does or would GDS do a fixed capacity in terms that extend out beyond the known auction rates? Ken? Uh, yes, yeah, so, so um, uh, we... We uh, we will enter we do we we can and do entertain um, fixing capacity costs beyond the, the known RPM window. Yeah, as as you guys know, the, the prices are currently set through uh, the planning uh, 1819 period. But uh, uh, from a from a from a market standpoint, liquidity beyond uh, beyond the, the known auction window is is extremely poor. So. Um, while while we are are willing to to price or, and, and fix capacity beyond that auction window, we we generally caution customers to uh, to consider passing through capacity costs um, beyond the the RPM window just because uh, the the bid ask is so wide and and, and liquidity premiums uh, can be can be quite high. That, that that we generally feel that um, it, that that customers would be better off um, only fixing only considering fixing capacity through the known RPM window and and, and passing through costs beyond that until until those until those auctions clear. Okay, thanks, Ken. The next one I have, uh, Jeffrey, for you. It would be any comments on what the outcome of the FERC 745 Supreme Court case might be. Um, thanks for the question. I think that the oral arguments uh, were very interesting last month. One justice recused himself because of uh, stock investments in Honeywell, I believe. So only eight saw it, which gives the potential for a 4-4 split. Some observers say that if the court was going to be 4-4 split, we would have heard it already. In that case, I think I've heard technically it comes down as if the Supreme Court never took the case and it just adopts the appellate court, lower court decision. So maybe we don't get a 4-4 split. Um, there were some very interesting discussions about what is a bright line between a wholesale transaction and a retail transaction. Um, I'll just comment that uh, Chief Justice Roberts made uh, a point that 
if he stood outside of McDonald's and offered $5 for someone not to go in and buy a burger for $3, what is the actual retail price of that burger? Is it $3 or is it $3 plus the lost $5 that you avoided, that you ignored by going in to buy the burger and therefore the retail price is actually 8 and he would have been the one um, impacting that retail price by standing outside. So there were some really interesting descriptions that are really at the high level about a bright line between wholesale and retail. Um, from the questions, it seems right now like a 4-4 split, but I am certain that there will be effort to move someone over, and I anticipate a tight decision um, sometime by uh, May or June. Okay. Thanks, Jeffrey. Let's try um, maybe two more questions, and then we'll wrap things up. So, Ken, it looks like another question for you. Um, I typically request fixed price product structures and appreciate a great level of detail when reviewing bids. Within the breakdown of pricing components, what causes suppliers to have different capacity numbers for the same term? That's for you, Ken. Uh, yeah, um, so uh, when 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 bundling um, capacity price into a into a fixed price offering, um, suppliers need to to calculate uh, the, the the cost of the capacity and then unitize that capacity cost over a customer's expected usage. And and uh, capacity PLCs uh, are typically only known um, one planning year in in advance. So. Um, so, uh, so different suppliers uh, have to both uh, potentially, uh, depending on the term, uh, forecast future uh, capacity PLCs beyond uh, beyond the period in which the PLC is known, uh, and they also must forecast uh, customers' uh, future usage. Um, so, depending upon the methodology that that each supplier uses in, in, in forecasting future capacity tags and forecasting future customer usage, um, they could potentially come up with, uh, you know, different values of, 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 of a bundled capacity rate, even though they're, they're pricing the same customer over the same term. Okay, thanks, Ken. You seem to have a bunch of questions here that are coming your way, so I have another one for you, if you don't sure. mind. Okay, sure. so for the capacity performance uplift calculation that you showed in the presentation, which was 38.17 per megawatt day for planning your 16.17, is that just the difference between the traditional BRA and new capacity performance price level adjusted for the percent of capacity performance needed in planning your 16.17? Basic question is, how did you come up with that number? Um, so, so th that number is, is 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 so just to back up a little bit, we we did a lot of uh, outreach um, and and Jeffrey was involved in that as well um, uh, with PJM to make sure uh, that 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 PJM was as tra as transparent as possible um, in 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 allowing um, suppliers and customers to identify. Exactly what that what the capacity performance uplift rate was going to be. So, um, if you if 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 anyone wants to go out to um, the transition the the P, on the PJ, the public PJM website, um, uh, you can you can pull up the results of the of the of each transition auction, and 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 there is. There is a specific. There is a column uh, that spe that that specifically shows um, that if you know, for instance, sixteen seventeen, the 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 capacity performance uplift uh, rate, if you will, for that that planning year. Um, but but basically, the way the, and the way PJM came up with that rate, without getting too much into the weeds, is is that. Um, uh, all the generators, some some that cleared and some that didn't, uh, uh, re-offered into the transition auction, and PJM basically just they, they when when all the when all the generators re-offered, um, PJM procured um, the, the 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 necessary uh, 
capacity products that it needed, and they, they calculated the total dollars um, that they spent under uh, the capacity performance construct and subtracted it from the dollars that they were going to spend um, based on the BRA, and, and, and that total uplift of dollars was then spread evenly over the, 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 the entire capacity obligation and then um, uh, peanut, uh, peanut buttered, if you will, across the entire RTO. So, um, so from a sort of from a transparency standpoint, uh, uh, that that thirty-eight dollar and seventeen uh, cents number is is one that you can go right out to the PJM website and 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 view for yourself. Um, so the, the, there really is no. Um, that the suppliers don't really need to recreate um, PJM's calculation as to how they got to that number. You can, you can, you can. Uh, it, it's posted uh, right there um, on their public website. All right, great, thanks, Ken. And so I'm going to give you a break. I'm going to switch it over to Jeffrey here. Um, the question is, what is the future of demand response, Jeffrey? Sure, thank you. I, I, I don't want to be speculative, but I, I think demand response is robust and its participation in markets is going to remain robust regardless of the Supreme Court decision. Demand response does not go away. So if the Supreme Court rules that demand response is not under FERC jurisdiction, is not an whole, a wholesale transaction, then the states will have to come up with their own programs and policies for ways to value demand response and mechanisms to pay demand response. You'll still see the, the impact of demand response at the wholesale level in the form of lower load. So, you know, it's a supply curve and a demand curve, and the demand curve will reflect lower demand at the ISO wholesale level, but in terms of programs, that will have to go to the state level, and it might take some time for the states to enact the rules for these programs. So in the meantime, you might see an initial hit to demand response megawatts, but eventually I don't believe demand response is going away. All right, thanks, Jeffrey. Okay, so I know we've extended the time today for you guys, so I hope you're okay with that. Um, what I'll do now is we'll just close the session um, quickly. The one thing I did want to do, though, um, briefly, is I want to take the opportunity to at least call your attention to GDS, who has his new brand, NG. Many have asked us why we are changing our name and also why NG. Uh, quite simply, we want to reflect the changes that are taking shape in our industry today. As many of you well know, there's more data than ever before. Companies are taking a bigger role in their energy strategies, and we are also much more focused on, as a whole on environmental stewardship. So our brand name, NG, is to represent our global group's transformation to embrace this evolving energy landscape. So in the coming weeks and months, you will begin to see more and more signs of the transition to our new brand. Please know that while our name is changing, our strengths in the retail sector will certainly remain the same. So in closing, thank you for joining us and participating in today's webinar. Feel free to reach out to all of us, any of us, if you have any further questions. This webinar has been recorded. You will receive a link to the slides and presentation later this week, so be on the lookout for that. That ends this webinar for today. Have a great afternoon. Take care.